Thank you. tonight I'm going to ask the counselors if they have any uh, any reports to make on any committees that they are serving on on behalf of the town is there any counselor who has a report to make tonight yes Frank I would just like to briefly just kind of uh, summarize the report that I gave to the executive committee of the Council of Governments as chairman of the Joint Services Division of COP and uh, what the, the executive committee asked me to, to be there, which I'll be now on a quarterly basis to report. And what I did this last time was talk about the last year of the Joint Services Division and what we've done. And the key words that I emphasized looking back over the last year of the Joint Services Division was accountability, because we, we really want people to know what we're doing with the Joint Services. Creativity, because we want to create new services. Selectivity, because we want to be careful to choose only certain services that are the most productive. <clears throat> and finally, self-sufficiency, because we want this division to become, to be able to stand on its own. It was a period also of self-examination and restructuring, because as you all remember, all bids now are funded exclusively from the user fees. No longer are we charging the communities by the hour, but they're, they're being charged by the user fees. So it was a major time of re-examination and restructuring on this committee. It was also a time of growth. We now have 21 major bids that all the communities of Cumberland County area are going in on together, from asphalt to uh, you know many, many different types of bids, fuel, uh, oil, you know, uh, gasoline, et cetera. So there's, there's a whole broad array, 21 different items that we're purchasing, as well as there's five or six that we're studying. So it's been a, it's been a major time of growth, self-examination, and restructuring, but still the key words in my opinion, and as I told the executive committee, are cooperation and communication. We have to have all players throughout Cumberland County working. The larger players, from the Portlands down to the smallest players, the Buxtons and, and the uh, Livermore, or whatever other towns are, are involved. And communication is also important. So this year, for the Joint Services Division, we're really trying to go out to the different councils and explain to them what we do and exactly how much money we're saving in each town so they can have a much better concept that it's not just some group of people sitting in Portland making decisions, but it affects each and every council. So we'll be going to different councils to make presentations, field questions, and do a lot more work out with the people. So this is kind of just, like I say, a brief summary of the report that I gave to the Executive Committee on behalf of the Joint Services Division. And I'll be continuing to report to this council and the citizens regarding our work for Cape Elizabeth. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Uh it's very important work you're doing because each year Cape Elizabeth does serve several, several thousand dollars, thousands of dollars uh, from our association with COG and, 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 and in particular the Joint Services Division. So that's very important work. Thank you for your report. Any other reports tonight? <coughs> okay, I'll just briefly update you on the Governor's Task Force that I'm serving on, on the school funding formula. Uh, we have had eight meetings. We have two meetings left. We are uh, Ass we have been assigned by the governor to report back to him on October, by October 1st, any changes uh, in the state school funding law that this committee would recommend. Uh, we are beginning to come to agreement, to a consensus. It looks like uh, we will be recommending that each community receive some state funds. Uh, presently, we have communities in the state of Maine because of their high property valuation and their few, a few number of students receive no state funds for education. The committee is recommending that, uh, seeing that the state f mandates uh, certain requirements for education, the state should pay some percentage of every child's education in the state. So that's one of the recommendations that will probably be coming out of the committee. Uh, also, we, uh, there seems to be a consensus to have a hold harmless clause uh, in, in the school funding formula. That would mean that no community would lose more than a certain, would not be, a, uh, would not lose more than a certain percentage of their school funding in any one year. This would help to stabilize the effect on the property taxes. Uh, we also are dealing with is the issue of lag time, that the school funding formula deals with two-year-old costs in education, and so we're trying to update them. Uh, so that the, the actual funding of, of education is more realistic. 
Uh, we're also talking about uh, having some uh, uh, indicator of income, uh, in the, if not in the formula itself, uh, maybe a trial uh, program where mandate, uh, not mandates, but incentive programs uh, would be, uh, could be begun in communities and uh, depending on what the income of that community is, uh, their percentage of of, of the monies coming for that incentive program uh, would be apportioned according to income as well as property. So we might try doing something uh, in that area. So th these are the main recommendations that I think may be coming out of that committee. But at our next, by the time of our October meeting, I will report you, but probably will have all been in the paper by then, you all know what has happened with that committee. Uh, any? Any, anyone have any correspondence that they'd like to report at this time? I would suggest that if you have correspondence on the bike pass that we talk about, that you bring those up uh, during the public hearing. Was there any other correspondence that should be brought to our attention? I'd just like to mention that I did get several letters, about 10 of them, from people in Delano Park uh, who uh, are, are raising many concerns that they have uh, about the Delano Woods uh, development. So I will leave these, I will circulate these for, for you all to look at after the meeting. Okay. <clears throat> all right, the first public hearing tonight uh, <clears throat> is on a request by the Inn by the Sea for a full-time hotel optional food, malt, spiritus, and Venice license. Michael, do you have anything that you'd like to uh, report on that license application. Uh, we don't need that. The town clerk's been doing most of the work on it. Uh, she could report better than I on the status of the in by the sea license. Debbie, Would you like to report on the status oh. of the in by the sea license? Okay, the in by the sea license. Uh, the application is now complete. Um, the public. Um, Legal advertisement has been put in the paper. There was confusion on uh, the license and when it expired. It did expire on 9-11. Uh, we do have a uh, signed statement from Alcoholic Bureau of Alcoholic Beverages that does give them uh, authorization to transact, transact their business uh, through September 28th. Uh, if the council does pass the um, liquor license this evening, then that will be well covered and we'll send it right in tomorrow. So everything is all set on that. Thank you. Jim. Anybody from the public like to speak on the end by the C's request? Okay. Uh, then I will close the public hearing on this item and we'll move on to the public hearing on parking along Route 77. Bikeways. <clears throat> we did have a public hearing on this item in July. Uh, at that time, I don't believe anybody from the public spoke specifically to the bikeway issue. I don't recall anybody. Once, however, once we did include the ban on parking <coughs> the bikeways uh, on, routes, on Route 77 and anywhere else if we had any other bikeways, uh, we did begin to receive public reaction uh, from people who live along the bikeways, people who were who uh, do cross-country skiing at the Perputa Club and at Crescent Beach Inn area, uh, requesting that we allow a chance for more input on this uh, parking ban and that they have a chance uh, to talk to us again about it. So at, at last month's meeting, uh, Council Carson requested that we uh, open that this question item up for public hearing again tonight. And uh, so that's why it is on the agenda. And at this time, I'd like to ask anybody who is interested in speaking on this item to please come forward. Is there anyone who would like to speak on the bikeway issue? Yes, sir. I would. <laughs> okay. Would you come forward and introduce yourself? Where do you want me? At the microphone? Or the will the microphone pick it? Yeah, the podium will be fine. Um, my name is Gary Beckwith. I live at uh, 10 Oakwood Road on, in Cape Elizabeth. And uh, I would like to address myself 
uh, totally in favor of the current ban on parking on Route 77 bike lane. Uh, the, uh, the rationale behind it is that I am one of the, a growing number of people who use the bike lane. Uh, I've been cycling to work for 15 years or so when the weather permits. Uh, I've watched Cape Elizabeth develop this magnificent uh, facility and have enjoyed using it and uh, have also uh, been involved with some of its complexities, uh, that is um, heavy traffic and cars parked in the, the uh, bike lane, especially commuting on the way home. Uh, for instance, and I made a couple of notations, uh, from the South Portland line to about State Avenue, there was frequently people who would park there and uh, without necessity, I think, they, an empty driveway but a car in front of the house. Um, this necessitates when you're in heavy traffic coming out of the bike lane and going around the automobiles and then back in. And that white line has a very psychological effect to drivers and to bike uh, uh, people who use the bicycle. Um, also, at the uh, from the corner of Spurwing down to this new Canterbury Way Road is another uh, place that cars would frequently park on the street. And again, coming home in commuter traffic, that's difficult. Um, I have noticed um, over the years since the bikeway has been uh, completed that uh, more and more people come to this community because of that facility. And I don't know whether you people in the council uh, have been aware of the number of people who use it. Uh, I'm even aware of um, well, as I ride it frequently, I oftentimes overtake this young man, although it takes some catching to do so, who trains in his uh, uh, wheelchair. And he uses this facility almost every day. Uh, I first weathered the week get on the road last March, he was out there. Uh, and it is a tremendous facility for him. Uh, I've noticed that my wife works at the library, and I've noticed that frequently there's a lady, I don't know where she comes from, but she parks in the library parking lot, takes her bike out, and rides the loop safely because she doesn't want to ride in traffic. Um, I will not speak about cross-country skiing and the parking uh, in the off-season because I, I really understand that there are people who bike all year round. I don't. When the snow is on the ground, I put my bike away until uh, it's, it's left. But I know that there are citizens within this community who do. Um, and for those people who like to have the uh, place to park for one reason or another, and for the, if you're going to really balance the issue, the people who use it and use it well and use it frequently, I think you are serving a much greater part of the population of this town and the surrounding community by banning um, the parking on the bike. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Beckwith. Is there anyone else who would like to speak? Yes. Uh, my name is Susan Garrity and I live at 193 Ocean House Road and I really don't see how you can begin parking on Ocean House Road being resident there. It would affect me a lot more than it will affect someone that drives their bike by my house because I have a driveway that two cars fit in and we have two cars and that means I can't have anyone visit me. And at Christmas time, I have everyone come to my house, and if I want to have anybody come over, it would be virtually impossible for them to do that unless I want to turn my 
front yard or the pavement and let them all block the <laughs> So um, I'm speaking very much against the van, and I have small children, and I ride along the bikeway with them in the carriage, but I don't find that there's enough cars there all the time so that it presents a real problem. And usually there's enough love in the traffic, so if there's a car there, we can go around either way, and I think that the bikers can do pretty much the same thing. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes. <coughs> I'm Dorothy Hoffman. I live at 69 Ocean House Road. Having lived here for 27 years, I feel that paying my taxes, <coughs> roads, and whatever else I'm capable of doing, that I deserve the right to park on the street. Like Mrs. Garrity, I too have people that come to visit me. It's difficult to drive into my yard. There's a dual parking lot between a neighbor and myself. They need their space, and I need my space. There are four cars in my house. Where do the people park that come to visit me? Where do we park if we want to pay by driveway? What happens when you have someone that wants to come and spend a day or a week or a weekend? I, too, share my feelings of banning the parking, of not banning the parking permission. Thank you, Mrs. Anyone else from the public? Yes, sir. My name is Thomas Fredericks. I'm on 251 Ocean House Road. And I spoke out at the August meeting on a brief statement against the parking on 77. I am still against parking on 77. I have been retired. I have monitored myself, maybe not at 8 o'clock or 7 o'clock when Gary goes to work. But I've been down at 9, 10, 11, 12 o'clock in the morning from Pond Cove to South Park. I have found very little <coughs> in the way of cars being parked in the daytime there. It's very spotty. I have also sat down in a chair in my garage on Sundays and Saturdays and counted the number of bicycles that have gone up and down in front of my house. And the highest count I've ever gotten in one day has been 12 bicycles. And four of those were local kids that went out with the crash helmets and back uh, bags and all that. So I haven't seen any real serious biking on 77 from Palm Cove in through the South Portland. Also in the same way, I don't think I've seen a half a dozen joggers on the street. Never more than one at a time. And these parking lanes from Sperling Avenue coming out through the Cape here are certainly wider than the car is. I can admit that somebody on a bike has got to take it easy going around it. But I mean, I don't think that the taxpayers here should provide bike pass to invite people from Portland or any other area to come out here just because we have large, wide bike paths. That's there for the town to enjoy, not everybody else. I think there's sufficient room there, and with careful uh, driving by the bikes, which in most cases, I feel the bikes should look out for the car, not vice versa. I'm a little old-fashioned on that, because I put on over 50,000 miles on a bike as a kid. And I always looked out for the car, because I didn't want to end up in a broken leg, whether it was my fault or the driver's fault. So I am strictly 100% against the van on 77. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Anyone else from the public? Yes. Well, I heard about this meeting tonight. I'm Elsie Danilo. Uh, Elsie, would you mind coming to the okay. podium? Thank you. I'm really not prepared to speak, but I am the mother of the bike way. They sat for a few years, and I still use it, and there are loads of people out there. I was out this afternoon, and there were at least a dozen serious bikers and walkers. And we got funds from the state, funds from the federal government, 
And I worked four years without let up to accomplish this thing. And I think it's the state, the people from the state thought one of the best things they've heard of in the way of a bike way connecting the beach and so forth with the town, the library, and making it possible for all the children to be safely transported on their bikes. And I think it's a tremendous asset to the town. I don't think it should be eroded by allowing this parking. Because when people park, you have to drive out into the road. And, and that's not expected. The cars are not expected to come out. They're not anticipating that. As you, that line is a very decisive dividing line. And uh, I think we should not allow parking. Thank you. Thank you, Elsie. Thank you for that history lesson, too. <laughs> uh, is there anyone else here tonight who'd like to speak on this item? Okay, I, I know I've received several phone calls and uh, a, a couple of letters, and I wondered if other council members have. Yes, Penny? Well, I just wanted to comment that, um, that I have received also several phone calls, and. In the line of doing the council work, we, they really are not, phone calls are not that frequent. And uh, people did call on this item. I will say that all the people that call were homeowners that live on Route 77 who were very upset because for the same reason that these two people spoke is that there was not room to have a guest or, or anybody come to visit their homes if they were not allowed to park on that street. And as they said, that happened that these three people that called said they owned the house prior to us putting a white line and making it a bikeway, when there was ample room for them to park a guest car out there. But when we put the white line in and made the bikeway, that changed it. And from those three people, the bikeway came after the purchase of their homes. So I just comment on those, those three phone calls that I have. Thank you, Penny. Bill? I have a couple of phone calls, and I also had a letter from Nancy Gimelon at 172 Ocean Off Road, and she is against the band as far as parking goes and it's under the same conditions that Penny just spoke of is that the house that she lives in is in a small lot and only has a small short driveway and sometimes somebody will come visit her they use the street to park in and she feels that uh, the changes would be a hardship to her and she was unable to be here tonight and, and wanted me to bring that up and she will be a little better. Okay, thank you, Bill. Anyone else? Yes, Nancy? I too received a call from <coughs> someone who lives on Ocean Hospital uh, that was against the band. And uh, it seems to me that the people who live along Ocean Hospital do have a legitimate complaint. And uh, right now, I'm in the mood to return this to the Ordinance Committee for further, um, further thinking. It seems to me we, we sort of have to share rights. Okay, we'll have a chance to, to make some recommendation uh, when we get to item 165 on the agenda. So if you want to at that time, Nancy, make that proposal. Okay. Lester, do you have, have you had any uh, comments? Or? I had just one phone call and uh, they wanted to reverse the decision we have made. Uh, right at that, they also lived on Ocean House Road. Okay. Doug? Yes. <laughs> but I don't, uh, I won't get into any of the conversation. It's all been negative against our vote. Against the ban? Against the ban, but I think I'll save some comments to later. Okay. Uh, I have two letters, uh, one from a Mrs. Lydon and one from uh, a Mrs. Parson, both opposed to the ban. Uh, one because she's a cross-country skier and the other because she lives uh, on uh, Route 77 and is concerned about the parking. Uh, I also had uh, two phone calls, one from a resident uh, of, on Route 77, and one from uh, Ann Stickney was opposed to the ban, and also a phone call from Peter Rich, who's a well-known cyclist in town and uh, does bicycle to work and home, all 
12 months of the year, I do believe, and, and he is opposed to making any changes uh, in the ordinance that we've already passed. Okay, uh, so I guess that kind of summarizes the communication that we have received. Uh, is there anyone else who would like to add anything at, <clears throat> at this point before I close the public hearing? Okay, then the public hearing on the bikeway is now closed. Uh, are there any, <clears throat> excuse me, any corrections to the minutes of our August meeting? I move that we accept the minutes as read. Second. As written, rather. Second. As written. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 That motion carries seven to nothing. Okay, item number 164 on the agenda is to consider a request from Great Bay Hotels that is the Inn by the Sea, for a full-time hotel optional food, malt, spirits, and Venice license. I move it be granted. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor of the motion? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Item number 165 is to consider the citizens' uh, comments that we've just heard on the recently adopted ordinance prohibiting parking in town bikeways. Yes, Lester. I move we uh, send this item to the ordinance committee for further study and uh, uh, that's my motion. Second. Uh, Second. Okay. Uh, discussion. Lester? Uh, I just my, I guess my feelings right now, uh, I, uh, I have sympathy with those people that live along there and have, that don't have enough room, so I would like to see the ordinance committee perhaps look at one or two things at least. Uh, the possibility of only having that bike lane on one side of the highway, full length, so that that might serve the purpose of uh, or the needs of those people that need that parking on the street. Um, I am inclined to think that the bikeway was a good thing, and if we are going to do away with the bike lane and uh, <coughs> parking there, <coughs> take the bikeway signs down and not advertise it as a bike lane. Can I ask the manager a question? Was there some uh, semantic difference in the words bikeway and bike route? Yes, the, I checked with the state to see what, if there are any strings attached to the federal and state dollars when we received them. Uh, they, when we received the, the grant to help build the bikeway, they designated Route 77 as a bike route if they had designated as, as a bike way or a bike lane, we would not be allowed to have parking there. But because it was only designated as a bike route, uh, it's, it's really a lo local option at this point. Um, I guess if we're gonna send it back to the ordinance committee, since the ordinance committee has just sent it to us, and we've just voted, it would seem appropriate that, that at some point that the council, rest of the councilors should make their opinions known to members of the ordinance committee, whatever they are, so that they can at least take that into consideration as well as the public comments. What I'd like to know is, is it possible to make the bike, bike route uh, for s s sort of, s the rules change as to seasons. When the winters come from like December 15th until whatever that is, January, February, March, April 1st, or whatever it is, whatever it's deemed to be snow weather, could we then have limited parking on that section of by Kaputik? Would that be defeating our purpose? I mean, is this something that we should we should certainly consider, right? Is that correct? Well, yeah, you asked. And to answer your question, you you know, without as long as you don't make the signs too complicated, and you, you make it you know simple enough for the public to understand, you could limit. You could have parking wherever you want it. Number one. With, with a few exceptions near hydrants and near streets, that sort of thing. Number two, you could perhaps limit it by hours of the day, no parking 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. Number three, you could limit it by season, 
no parking uh, April to November. Uh, you could have no parking in a business zone, which tends to be the, the more congested areas. You could set it so that, you know, in certain areas with a, you could also add in an additional feature where it would, there's some spots where the bike lane is, is only four feet wide, no parking in that area. There's all sorts of options, all of which the ordinance committee could look at and consider. Well, it, I'm sure that, that historically, councils in a situation like this would try and do one thing and like to have it carry through throughout so that it's not a complicated issue. Talking about seasons, of course, does not address the issues of the people who live in that road. And it is one of the few roads in, that has a bikeway that has a wide bikeway on both sides of the road. Now, I don't know anything about the traffic or the impact or anything that, that it would cause, but it seems to me that the ordinance committee is going to have to consider people who are residents that live on that road, uh, people who are bikers like Mr. Beckwith who want to uh, maintain the ban that we voted on before. There's a lot of things to consider here, and we have a lot of people to try and be concerned about. I think that there is one thing to consider is that the citizens of this community come first, and any of those who do not live in Cape Elizabeth, unfortunately, will have to come into second place. So the, there was a point, you know, providing a bikeway for everybody all over the world. I understand that. But I feel that there is some leeway now. If the verbiage says bike route, we are in a position where we can make some changes, and we just have to agree on what they're going to be. Frank? I'd like to speak to I'd like to speak to that and also to the process that we go through here in Cape Elizabeth in creating ordinances. The ordinance committee met and discussed this at length. We debated these issues. Th this is it isn't like that. This is the first time that this has come up. As all of you know, we debated the issues, brought our recommendations, which were unanimous to the council, who then set it for a public hearing, which transpired, and then the law was adopted. So all I'm saying is, in looking over the. I guess I'm speaking against sending it back to the Ordinance Committee. The Ordinance Committee has debated the issues and unanimously brought forth an, a proposal that was adopted unanimously by the Council. Now, if we wish to change that due to other input, I feel we should do it at this level. We're going to have to just thrush these issues out. Why not just do it now? I'm fully prepared to debate it, vote it tonight if we wish to change it or come up with a compromise solution. But to put it back to a committee that voted three to nothing in favor of this, and then seven to nothing, this committee, I know, I know times change, and I know we have to have flexibility. Don't get me wrong, but in terms of the process, I really seriously question sending it back to a committee that voted it after debating it three to zero. Why don't we just debate it here and now? I'm ready to, I've got a list of, of options, for some compromises, some maybe, maybe there's no compromise, I don't know, but it seems like an inevitability that we're going to debate it at the council level. Why not just do it tonight? So I, I will not vote in favor of sending it back to the Ordinance Committee. Okay, Frank. <coughs> Nancy? <clears throat> well, I hate to speak against my chairman of the Ordinance Committee, but Frank, you know, new facts do come to light. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I think another uh, resolution might be special permits for the people who live on Ocean House Road who were going to have guests could just call the police department and, and announce that fact so that the police would be aware. I mean, I do think we have to be flexible. I do think we have to share the right of that part of the road. I'm not, I'm not debating that. I'm just simply speaking to the process. I'm not debating. There's no question, as I've said time and again, when new facts arise or citizens' concerns, we need to discuss it. All I'm saying is all the Ordinance Committee will do is set up the recommendation that will then be debated. Unless every councilor now goes, as Penny said, and tells exactly what's on their mind, then all we do is provide a recommendation that stimulates the discussion. Why can't we, why can't we already stimulate and have that discussion tonight? I don't understand what the, what the process, why do you look to us to bring a recommendation that has to stimulate the discussion? We can have it tonight. I think there's three major reasons why we voted as we did, public safety being one, and maintaining the integrity of the bike route is the other, as was stated tonight. If a parking is allowed, there is no bike road. There cannot be a bike road. We would be in potentially a libelous situation to say we have a bike route and then consistently ask the people to come out onto the road. And all the publicity and attention that's gone into the Cape Elizabeth bike road, the bike road will be ended. Now, I'm, I'm not trying to be overly emotional, but that's just the fact of the matter, as Lester, Lester just said. So, I don't know, once again, just from my vantage point, I don't see a point in sending it back to the ordinance. I'm prepared to debate it tonight. So. Okay, Lester. In light of what Frank is saying, uh, 
perhaps this issue is large enough to have a workshop for the whole council uh, and debate these things. Rather than take mm -hmm. an hour or two here mm -hmm. at a council meeting, maybe we should take a couple or three hours at a workshop and concentrate on this one issue and then uh, bring it back to the council. Because I, I don't think it should be a quick decision tonight. And if, you, and if we try to debate it tonight, it's apt to be a, uh, a quick decision. And it needs more than more thought than just uh, a few seconds here and there. Thank you, Lester. <coughs> Doug? If you'll amend your motion to put it into a workshop, then I won't have to say anything right now, <laughs> which would be fine with me. Or either that or we could vote on Lester's motion. Motion, motion has been and made and to change, so therefore I'll put in my two cents worth real quickly. <laughs> when we voted not to have any parking on the bikeway, it was done in an idealistic way. I mean, you just say, well, there's going to be bike shoes. They won't have to go out around cars. And there have been some parking problems that we're all aware of on, on the bikeways. And I also voted because I thought if you were to have a party or some people over to your home, then you could simply call the police department and tell them that you, you'd like to have the area in front of your house uh, reserved for parking or available for parking. And if it wasn't a sight distance problem or on a hill or whatever, the police department could perhaps grant the right to park there. If thinking that through after the vote, if the police department allows people to park in a no parking zone that's being used for bicycles and someone should get hurt, then this town, I would think, would be ripe for, for pretty good suit. So I've come 100% around in my thoughts on parking in the bike lane. I wouldn't encourage it, but I wouldn't want to restrict it because of the rights of the landowners that live along that bike route. I think you either have it or you don't. You don't have it seasonally, you don't have it nine to five, you don't make all these rules that are very inconsistent and hard to follow. There are ordinances that, that provide that you not park within a certain distance of intersections. There are ordinances that provide for no parkings around the crest of a hill or in dangerous areas. And I think that those could be uh, enforced. And I think uh, we have no alternative to, but to permit parking. And uh, I would hope that we can have a workshop on this, but if we were to vote tonight, I'd vote against it, against parking in the bike lane, against restricting the parking in the bike lane. OK. Bill? I, uh, as a member of the Ordinance Committee, don't see no harm in sending it back to the Ordinance Committee because I feel, as Lester has said, that there's a lot of discussion, a lot of time could be spent on this because I got some ideas and I don't see why you couldn't restrict it for certain hours. I don't think you have too many bikers after dark and I don't think, and I think a lot of your parking that is needed for the homeowner and the evenings and what have you is uh, in the evening. So I think something can be worked out here. I'm against allowing parking in a certain of the business areas in the town. And I was down by the inn by the sea the other day. And they had a shindig and they had some cars in the bikeway. And they weren't up on the lawn either. So I think there's areas like that should be restricted as far as parking unless you allow them to park on one side and let the bikers go on the other side. Uh, I think by the time you get up as far as John and Farm Market or what have you, he might want to have them park out there. So you're going to be switching from one side to the other. I think it's going to take a lot of thought here to come up with something that's workable. I know it's not going to be for everybody, but I think it will work for the majority of the people. I agree with these people that have a short driveway, a small driveway, and their homes been there for years, they widened the road up, took part of their land, put the bikeway in, now they want to restrict them from using that. And I think we should look to those people and see if we can help them out some way. Okay, Penny? Didn't this whole thing come up with, just the whole, the whole item came up because of Crescent Beach, is that right? Or did it come up because of the Pakuda extension? No, it came up because the council was doing a total look again at a number of ordinances, one of which was the traffic ordinance. There was a provision in the traffic ordinance which said there was no parking between the travel 
in the safety, something to the effect, in the safety lane between the travel way and the adjacent curb. Well, that had been interpreted as meaning no parking and bikeways, and in fact, there were a few signs that have long been up on Route 77 stating that. It was felt that we ought to, we ought to just make it clear so that the police would have something to enforce uh, if, in fact, that is what you, that is what you wanted. Uh, it was no parking and a bike, but uh, it was reviewed by the Ordinance Committee. It was agreed with the knowledge and with the thoughts in effect at that point that there should be no parking. It was subsequently agreed to reconsider it, and that's what you're going to be doing tonight. It's also my understanding that the state does not plan to open or plow their entranceway to Crescent Beach State Park in the wintertime. That was the letter they sent to us. Okay. Now, I mean, it only takes about 20 minutes for the bike route. That's what we're supposed to call it, the bike route, to get cars in it over at Crescent Beach State Park. When you get 150 people out there on recreational use in the wintertime, I want to tell you something, that's not the best use for our police department to out put tickets on every one of those citizens out there. I mean, I, I really feel that we're going to have a serious problem here. And, and I, you know, I tend to agree with Doug. I mean, maybe, maybe we've looked at this the wrong way. We either can do it or we can't do it. And we've got to decide which way it's going to be. But, but anyway. Frank? I, I just wanted to speak to the actual letter in mm -hmm. terms of whether or not they're going to open. And, and the, paragraph, the third paragraph is, from, this is from Herb Hartman, who's the director of the Department of Conservation, that will make the decision as to whether or not to open Crescent Beach so there isn't such a parking mm -hmm. congestion. And he states, we'll keep an eye on this issue and should probably talk about it again this winter if parking continues on the road in spite of our plowing to the gate. Thus, I think he's amenable to our discussing it again. Because any solution to me, one of the key elements of the solution has to be that opening, to get rid of that congestion in there. I mean, that, that is something that I'm going to work for and, and work really hard on trying to get them convinced that they have to open a little bit more so parking doesn't develop out there because it's a nasty situation. I've just been in there during too many snowstorms, during too many slick ice conditions where I could have just easily glid into, glided into citizens, and it's wrong. So anyway, that's, I just wanted to clarify. That's Glide into that. citizens on Route 77 or inside the, the state park? When you're, even if you go slow, as they're outside getting their cross-country skis and everything ready, it can be slick. And I've had to slow down to 20 or 15 miles an hour as people are walking and dogs are getting out of cars, etc. So it's a dangerous situation at Crescent Beach. I'm just saying I don't want to give up on forcing the state to open up the gate. I don't think we have to give up on that. Okay, I just wanted to clarify that. Nancy? I, I have a question. Um, for anyone who cares to answer. In the winter time, is the bikeway mm -hmm. fully plowed? Yes. Right back to the dirt? Yes. Public works was next to the Winter was so long ago. Two citizens ago. are saying no. <laughs> <laughs> it's a big pile and you can't even see out of it when you back any driveway. Maybe you could direct it. <laughs> I don't have a sidewalk. Okay, way. Penny. Um, when you comment about, you know, if you remember when we took this vote, I was not comfortable. I don't really remember what everybody else's position was, but I didn't really want to vote for it. But I felt forced into voting for it because of there was, of course, some hazard or liability of concern with it. I don't feel quite strongly about that now. Do we have a similar liability in possibly many, many roads all over this town? I mean, we don't provide for any special areas for joggers, and goodness knows what it's like on Shore Road, where people jog and bike all the time on a wretched situation. And we're not making any provisions for them. Uh, you know, I'm in all, see, I'm in a real quandary. I am in complete favor of a bike route. There's no question about it. But I really feel badly for these citizens. I think they're going to squeeze play, and they're going to get squeezed out. <coughs> Hey, Frank? Can I just comment on that again? I have to. Uh, <laughs> they only do this in a workshop. You know what? This is why I think we, we need but, to either take, an, take some action on less but there, is, but there is a the one glaring difference is that we, we have designated this a bike route and publicized it profusely as such. That's the difference between Shore Road and 77. Okay. But I also think we should do a workshop because whatever decision is made, we need to have the police chief's input and, I don't know, public works input, but, but it's hard to do that in this forum. Okay. Uh, we do have a motion before us, and I'd like to uh, put that motion to the council at this time, and that is to send this whole issue of the bypass back to the audience committee. All those in favor of that motion. But you make the motion. 
Yes, I did, but I changed my mind. Okay, all those opposed? Okay, that motion fails three to four. Lester, do you have another motion? Yes, I, I'd like to make a motion that we send this to a, a town council workshop. Do you have a date? <laughs> no, I didn't have a date to have something. September 21st. We already have a workshop. That's the night that we have the, can we, can we fit it in there? I'll ask the uh, manager, do we have time that evening? I think if every councilor gives it much thought before the meeting and, and comes with ideas, prepared to discuss them, it won't take that long. Okay, September 21st. Can, can we have the chief of police there and the chief of public works? The director. The director of public works will be unavailable that evening. He will communicate his views to the chief and I and represent him. Okay. All right, is there a second to Lester's motion? Second. Is there any discussion? All those in favor of the motion? All those opposed? <laughs> the motion carries five to two. All right, so we will have a workshop on this item uh, next Monday, beginning probably at 7.30. No? You already have a schedule. You could, okay. you could do that at 7.30 and move all the other stuff back a little. I would think if we have to have the chief there yeah, for just that one item, that would be do it first. kind of us to move that up. Okay. He, all right. He doesn't. Uh, we have a citizen comment. Oh, yes. Okay. Yes. Who are the members on this workshop? Is it the entire council? All of council? us. Mm -hmm. It'll be a total council workshop. And, and the public, public, if you wish to come. Public. Anybody? Oh, sure. All of our meetings are public meetings. Down in the cafeteria. 7.30 and the 21st. Bring your friends. <laughs> okay. Uh, a workshop is usually not a time for lots of pu public comment, but the public is welcome to attend. It's usually a, it's a time when the, the council tries to use the input that they've already received uh, to, to, kind, to try to come to a consensus on the item. And any action that we take uh, would not be taken until the October meeting. So this is a workshop, but final action would be taken at our regular monthly meeting in October. Okay, item number 166, to consider referring to the ordinance committee responsibility for studying parking on Woodland Road near the Woodland Apartments. Michael? This is a very easy issue for the, uh, the ordinance committee <coughs> to review. Mainly what we're looking for is a parking ban between the, the two main entrances to the Woodland Apartments. There was a ex very serious accident there about a month or so ago. It is a turn. Uh, there's no need at all for the vehicles to park it. There's plenty of space inside the parking lot, uh, and people just park up there for whatever reason would like to uh, ban parking out there, would like to have the ordinance committee uh, consider it and the full ramifications of it. Do we hear from the chief first before we vote, or do we wait for the audience committee to give one? Uh, does the chief want to speak on this item at this as, point? As read. Okay. <laughs> All right. I'm Doug, we refer this. Oh, just a minute, Nancy. Doug. Okay, Madam Chairman, I would I would ask that we refer this to the ordinance committee with a further notification of all residents concerned that they be notified of what the ordinance committee is considering in some manner. In other words, we're talking about a small area, we're talking about a small group of people who may park there. And is it logical to ask them for comment? Or would it be all apartment dwellers? We're probably talking a list of about 80 people because of all the apartments there. We don't even have names, unfortunately, about the people who live there either. Couldn't we send a notice to the apartment buildings? We could and ask them to post them. Well, if, if it's just the apartment, I'm not really concerned because they have adequate, they must have adequate on-site parking. I mean, that's, that's an ordinance. I mean, that's why they got the building. But if there are any private homes here that may lack for parking, I would like them to be at least notified so it doesn't become another bikeway issue. Yeah. If there's only one yellow house, then it's not a problem. No, the yellow house is quite a ways down from this point. It, it's simply the apartments. And there's, there's always spaces available inside. Okay, then I would modify my motion just to refer this. To the audience committee? Second. Any discussion? Bill? Just want to understand this in my own mind. 
Does that pretty much mean the length of Woodland Road from College Pound Road to the corner? It's a very short distance. Well, I think that's what you, what I would call spotting things around. There's apartment houses and garages that go pretty well the length of it, don't they? It's only on the current uh, council that we feel that the no parking is necessary. Between where those two entrances are? Yeah, I don't know where the two entrances are, but I think there's other areas there. Yeah, ordinance committee can look at it. <laughs> Any other discussion? We'll come on and cite walk. All right. Any other discussion? All those in favor of the motion? Aye. Okay. Any opposed? Motion carries 7 to 9. Okay. Item 167, to consider establishing an adjusted rate per hour for the hiring of town police officers for special jobs. Michael? The police chief and I have been looking at the, the overtime cost to have police officers work special jobs. That's when either the school department or someone hires a police officer. Uh, the average hourly overtime rate of our offices at time and a half is 1547. When you add up all the different benefits involved, it comes out to 1952 per hour is the town cost. That doesn't include an allowance of such things as vacation, doesn't include Blue Cross, Blue Shield, some other things. Uh, we would recommend uh, that you therefore reset the rate adjusted from the current $18 per hour to $20 per hour uh, for the hiring of our <coughs> special jobs. So moved. Second. <coughs> Any discussion? Any opposed? Motion carries 7 to 9. Well, uh, just a slight discussion. Uh, admittedly, uh, $20 really isn't going to cover our costs, so why don't we at least try to get our costs? What was yep. that? $20 isn't going to meet our costs, I, so I don't I don't see why we don't try to at least meet the cost. Maybe that should be $20. It covers the $19.52. Yeah, directly. Manager is telling us that there are other costs beyond that. It, it, oh, it, 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 I should explain, it doesn't cover our costs when we have one of our regular offices or sergeants covering it. If we bring in one of our uh, special police officers to do it, if they have already refused the overtime, then it does cover our cost. In some situations, we will lose a slight amount on this. In others, we will, we will make a profit. And remember that people have to hire the police officer for four hours. That's the minimum. We have to pay them. Yeah. You know, you, you know, you could. I think you could charge, you know, up around twenty-two, and still very much be in in the the area we should. I think it also you should remember probably about seventy-five percent of the special jobs now are, are the cables of the school department. So would that be fair, Chief? So we're getting from another source to give to ourselves. Frank? What percentage, would, if you had to guess, are the higher paid officers versus the percentage that would be the officers which we quote unquote create a net? I would defer to the chief to answer that question. Well, about 60% of the special jobs are filled by full time officers, about 40% by officers. And then I agree with Lester. 60% is too high of a time to be. If we're going to be adjusting the rate, we should adjust it to what we're going to at least break even with the higher paid officers. There's no, there's no use going to 20 if it's going to cost us more 60% of the time. So <clears throat> that's my opinion. Thank you. Lester? I think another thing to look at is that uh, I don't know that there's been a time of negotiation that we have maintained that pay scale. We've always gone up for the pay scale. So maybe before we even put this into effect, we may be paying more. No, uh, I'm inclined to believe that we should maybe, e even though we may be above what we have actually have to pay out, uh, it's going to catch up uh, in, a, in a very short time. Okay. Yes, Bill? Uh, the uh, the out-of-pocket costs and what have you if a guy goes on an overtime job is the Social Security, State Retirement, Workman's Comp. The Blue Cross and what have you, if they work extra hours, does that cost a ton more? No. So, they're going to get, the town is going to pay for that Blue Cross, regardless whether they worked an extra job or not for that officer, right? That's correct. Well, then I don't think we should turn this around and try to make bucks, especially with the biggest percentage from the school department. I feel we should be realistic about it. If we can get out of it for an actual out-of-pocket cost, I think that's what we should do. 
Okay, we do have a motion to increase the hourly rate charge for a police officer to $20 an hour. Is there any further discussion of this motion? I, well, I would just like to, to say before we vote that I'm in favor of increasing the per hour cost tonight above $20. We're voting on a motion to increase it to 20. That's correct. I just. Yes, Frank? I, I would just like to get clear the answer again. I don't want to get conflicting answers. First, we were told that the actual cost is probably above 20. Is, is the actual cost above 20 or not? It, the, the actual cost, including if you did a true overhead computation, including the fact that we were eventually having to pay the, the personnel for vacation, for sick leave, all those sorts of things, which aren't direct, which are indirect that, that are there and that, that we have to meet. If you look at all those things, for that 60% of the time when one of our offices is working, we're losing. Uh, I would guess, you know, rather than $20 per hour, it should be up in the range of 23. Uh, however, when we're having one of our, uh, our, our other officers there who's not a full-time officer, who are now paid, how much an hour? Seven? Eight, about eight dollars an hour. Uh, you know, with the add-ons there, we're probably at eleven dollars an hour. We're earning a significant amount on them when we charge twenty. On balance, we make a profit at the twenty, but we do lose uh, sixty percent of the time uh, when our when our regular officers uh, are there. <coughs> but it, but it comes out better in the long run. Yeah. Time. So then, basically, the debate is: what are we putting into the overhead? And as Councilor. Jordan says here, he feels the numbers here he's comfortable enough with in terms of what we're building into the overhead. We're putting an awful lot into the overhead when we have our part-time offices working. We're, we're under the amount we should be charging an overhead when the full-time offices are working. Okay. Any further discussion on this motion? <laughs> what is the motion? The motion is to increase the hourly to 20. Uh, rate to $20 from 18 Okay. All those in favor of the motion? All those opposed? Okay, the motion carries four to three. Right, item 168, to consider a report from the polling place committee and take any necessary action. Debbie, do you want to report on this? Um, as you can see in your packet, we do have a written report from the committee. As I stated in the last council meeting, we are still uh, recommending the high school, the reasons that I stated in the report. Um, our election warden, Henry Adams, is here tonight if anyone has any questions. He has been down to the high school today to check out different things as far as the parking, um, handicap accessibility, and so forth. So if you have any you know, questions directed to myself or Henry or the polling committee, we'll be glad to answer them. Henry, do you have any comments, preliminary comments you'd like to make? Yes, maybe just a couple. Uh, Henry's very short on words. <laughs>
if you go in the pool door, there's about an inch and a quarter threshold, which is, which is a quarter of an inch higher than the state allows for uh, accessibility at a voting place. Uh, however, it's enough to get over. But once you get into the pool door, all of the weight equipment there is, is locked in between that and the other door, so that would have to be moved and the gratings put up so they could go in the pool door. Or they could go in the door by the uh, boiler room, between the boiler room and the cafeteria. Uh, and that would be probably the most accessible place. So the place is, as far as, as, far as uh, handicap accessibility, it's, it's accessible to uh, to the handicapped voter. And if and there's nothing else in the other end of town that is accessible to the to the handicapped voter. Uh, you can't put a, a, a handicapped a voting booth in a tent outside of St. Albans Parish House because that, that would be the type of discrimination. Uh, the other thing is that uh, if we voted in two places, we'd have to duplicate the, the election uh, uh, staff. That would be another election warden. And most importantly, it would be another uh, counting device to count the votes after election day. Uh, so that, uh, because the people will be putting the ballots in the voting place. So uh, I think that the, that the council, then, then I guess Frank Latore raised the question at the last meeting about if, if there was a snowstorm. And I have been assured by uh, Director of Public Works that every item of snow removal equipment, every ounce of salt, every pound of sand will be available on election day. Uh, so we don't have any problems with that. But I, I think that uh, you should consider going down to the high school if you do not want to use this place and you've already encroached into the, into the uh, council chamber somewhat. And if it was a rainy day and there will be an awful lot of people out of this next election because of the nuclear referendum, if it's a rainy day, we're going to have an absolute zoo here. And I think that uh, the report from the committee is that we should move down to the high school. And I urge you to make that decision tonight because there's an awful lot of work that's got to be done. Notification to the state, notification uh, to the school department tomorrow night at the school board meeting, and then uh, signs and so forth have to be made. We can speed up the lines by dividing the books into thirds, so we've got a lot of, a lot of work we've got to do. So I would urge you to consider tonight, perhaps, uh, consider going down to the high school. Thank you. Would anybody from the public like to speak on this uh, issue of changing the polling place for the residents of Cape Elizabeth? Okay, if not, Penny? Could I ask uh, either Debbie or, or Henry some logistical questions? I, I'm in favor of it because you're in favor of it. You know, your committee recommended it, and I, and I agree with your position. The only thing I, I assume that you discussed in your discussions, the logistics of getting the cars in and out. I mean, if that one driveway, we have to go around the circle of the flagpole of the school or out past public works. I mean, would it be the public works and the police chief's feeling or your feeling that you would come in one driveway and out one driveway? Uh, no, so mm -hmm. this is parked down behind the, down by the, behind the school, high school. I know, but you have to get out of there. Well, there's two ways to get in. You can go in by the public yeah, but I mean, would you have one way in and one way out? Or, well, that's, I mean, that's because that's, be. that's a narrow road. It's even a narrow road coming down to the pool from, from the road that goes by in front of the high schools. I'll bet you it's going to be a real problem there. I just wondered if there was any discussion about getting people in and out. And also at 120 when the high school gets out and all of their cars come out, was there any study of the, any thought of how you might move those kids out of their parking lot while people are coming in and out of their driveway? I know I'm going to be there. Yeah, the students will be there, but they won't be parking down in the back where the voters will be. I know that, but there is a large parking lot of about 80 or 90 cars right up there on the flat behind the IGA. I just wondered, when you come out of that driveway by the pool, you've got people coming in and out, and you've got, you know, 150 kids coming out. I just wondered if there well, was take, any discussion. It will take the police officer about five minutes to load that parking lot. I don't think they Is that right? Much. And that's really yeah. the slowest time for voting also. Yeah. It's only twenty dollars an hour for the election to hire us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I just wondered why this had to come up. I think traffic is going to be a, a problem. I was just curious if you would discuss it. It'll be coming up in. A minute. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, Bill, do you have some issues? Oh, Nancy, there? I know. Oh. Well, okay, Nancy. Penny, we did not discuss the problems of, of getting the students in and out and and the voters in and out. Of, of the school property, but we did discuss all the problems with the traffic and the parking here. Oh yes, which okay. are 
works. No, and also, when you get behind that pool, how does one, when cars are coming in, how does one back out of their parking space? And, I mean, I think it's going to, I think it's terrific. I just was curious if you would discuss those problems, and I certainly don't want to discuss them now. That parking lot's designed, designed like any other parking lot. The pits. <laughs> no. What? But yes, Frank? Along those lines, might it be good, I think there's many of us here that are going to be in favor of it, probably will pass. It may, might it be good to have one last meeting just to talk about logistics between the chief of police and, is, do you think that's necessary? Because I think what Penny's talking about is, is important. No, it's well, all set. What, there's a game plan that's been worked out, or it's just a free-for-all? I don't, I don't envision it being a free-for-all, but I think the November uh, referendum time would be a good test to see yeah. how. How it's going okay, to just true. Well, I think Penny's point Before is very well taken. Before a presidential well election, at least, anyway. I thought it was a good I think the point is very well taken. <laughs> Has it been discussed whether one way should be one way in, another way, another way out? If, if not, I don't understand you why can't, beer is not. Okay, wait. Uh, excuse me. Excuse me. Go in and out the same road. Would you uh, Penny? Would you all mind just raising your hand and being recognized so we don't have a free-for-all here before we have a free-for-all at the voting place? Who would like to speak next on this issue? Well, the committee is going to discuss logistics again, right? All right. Uh, if you think it's necessary, I, I think it's something that the, pub, uh, that the police department can handle. Yes, Bill. I just want to say a couple of things. That I was, I wish to have the record state that I'm not 100% in favor of this report. And I guess it was put together with all without all my knowledge because they had a meeting that I didn't attend. I have outlined the next to last paragraph on the report and I disagree with what they've said 100% that this would not interfere with the school, teachers, staff, parking, and so forth. At the same time, allow the election workers parking, and voters parking, handicap accessibility, and space in the gym with poll watchers and so on and so forth. Now, if there's teachers and workers and what have you that park there now because I believe they need that parking lot, where are they going to go? They're going to be sent up to the other parking lot as I understand it. So they're going to have to share that one parking lot with the kids for that day. Where are they going? The man just shaking his head. Where are they going? The plan, the plan is to take, there's a very limited amount of staff that parks down there but there is some. The plan is to have those folks go up by the tennis court in that triangular lot adjutting the soccer field. They don't use that during this time of year? I mean, no, that's empty. Time. That's totally empty. That's totally empty. Nobody's in that. Okay. My next point is that I agree 100% with Penny of the people going in and out and the weather conditions and I agree with it. I am also disagree with, the, with uh, voting when you've got the students mainly in around, I know some of them can come in and they can get right into the gym without getting in where the cafeteria and the hall and the lobby, but any of the handicaps that will have to come in, like Henry Adams said, by the uh, boiler room and between that and the cafeteria and work their way down through. And I still feel, and I said it all my time on the committee, that the school department and the town should get together and work it on a, have their schedule on a workshop day, and then you could either go to the middle school or the high school, and they set their calendar up for each year for the elections. And you know in advance when the elections are, and I think that's the day to have it, and then you don't have the students and the voting public you know, getting, going in around each other in the same building. And I'll bet you when the school is out and the automobiles leave the park and law up above, that the, some of them will be driving down back because they get to go to the swimming pool. And this also will affect the swimmers that are up there in the morning. The elderly people or the people that go there in the morning for swimming, this will affect them because they park down there. And they're going to have to park up front, I understand, and walk down through the school. I don't think you people have looked at this 100% of how it's going to affect all the people. I'm against it. Okay. Uh, in answer to your question about the students being around, uh, the superintendent of schools, Daryl Pelletier, has 
is very feels very positive about having the high school be the uh, uh, election place because he feels that it's an excellent educational experience for the students to see the adults in the community voting, uh, to see democracy in action. He also feels it's, it would encourage the 18-year-olds, the seniors, many of the seniors, uh, to register and, and to use their, uh, their uh, enfranchisement and to vote. So he feels that it, it's an educational opportunity to have, to, for the students to have uh, the adults in the community voting in the high school. And there are several school systems uh, in the state uh, which use their schools regularly for voting and do not close school. So I, I think that if it's been done uh, with ease, and the superintendents we talked to uh, in the area said that they've never experienced any problem uh, with having uh, the voters and the students there on the same day. So it, it's not like we're breaking new ground here. Uh, so. I personally uh, feel that the high school is the most ideal of the places that we have available to us. Uh, none of them, none of them are perfect. Uh, but certainly we know all the problems we've had here at the town hall. Uh, I think Henry very eloquently spoke to, to the issue of having two polling places. Uh, that is, while we are a growing community, we still have, I don't think, have grown to the to the extreme that we need to have another fall in place. Yeah, we may at some point, but I don't think we're there yet. And uh, the middle school, if you think the parking in the high school is gonna be difficult, the middle school area is just so congested, it's, it's ridiculous. I think there are a lot of safety problems there. Uh, you have to park on, you'd have to use both sides to park on, you'd have people walking out between cars, uh, and you definitely would have to close school, no question. Yes, Could Penny. I say just one more thing about okay, the middle Bill. school? Yeah. One thing about the middle school, you've got a way in and a way out. They all don't have to go in and out the same way, the same road. In fact, there's two ways out. One way in, you can go up and swing and go up by the elementary school, or you could go out by the public safety building. <coughs> and it's, they come in one way park, and I'll admit, you've got to have, you can't have school and use a middle school. I'll agree with that 100%. But I say that could be worked out. Okay, Penn? Uh, I, I'm in favor of the high school. I don't want anyone to get, get me wrong on that. I'm in favor of the high school. But maybe to shorten this, uh, maybe the manager and the town clerk and the police chief and the warden could look now, having could look at the traffic situation and think about whether you just want to leave it or whether you want to make some adjustments to it. And also maybe you might think about whether or not the pool should be open that day. I don't question the school. The pool, the pool and all of the community services. Yeah, I mean, I might actually. consider that, you might consider that part of it. And I assume you'll look at the traffic thing to see if there's anything that you feel has to be done. Would you, are you and prepared then to make a motion? I am, and I so move that we make the, now wait a minute, if, if we, if I say we're making this the polling place forever, <laughs> we can, we're just Nothing's making, forever. <laughs> all right. I move Even your motions aren't forever. Yeah. I move that we make the uh, new polling location for the town of Cape Elizabeth to the Cape, at the Cape Elizabeth High School beginning at the November 3rd election. Second. Any further discussion? Don't you look at the traffic? Yes, Frank? I, I, the reason that I'm gonna be voting for this, I think is very well stated in the recommendation that came to us, which maybe many of the citizens haven't been able to see, but in the second recommendation as to why it would be good to have it at the high school, it states, consequently, it's a good location for the coming together of the entire town and for the fostering of a sense of community. And I have really given this a lot of thought. I've received some phone calls on it one way and another. And what I really think the bottom line is it's a good community day. It's almost a holiday atmosphere in the town. You get to see your neighbors. You get to kibitz a little bit out front. And I think that that's a good sense of community, having it in one place. So I spoke last time in terms of I was still open to having it in two places. But I, I agree with the spirit of, of this report. So I, I'm going to be voting in favor of this. Any other comments? All right, all those in favor of the motion? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, the motion carries six to one. <coughs> all right, item 169. Thank you, Henry. And thank you, Debbie, for your uh, research and leadership on this commission. 
Item 169 is to consider a report from the Ordinance Committee regarding parking on Ocean House Road near Kettle Cove and regarding parking on Pheasanton Road. Yes, okay. Frank. Madam Chairman, uh, parking is a big issue with us tonight and it's here again. So what we're talking about this time is parking, the parking dilemma on Ocean House Road between Bowery Beach Road and the Kettle Cove area and also on the Pheasanton Road in that entire area. We have various elements that are at work in this particular decision, and one of them is cars that are blocking yards and driveways on busy days. All you have to do is drive down Ocean House Road one beautiful summer day, and you know exactly what we're talking about, where people, not only driveways are blocked, but access to their yards, etc. So we have that problem, and yet we have people that want to have gatherings, that want to have parties, etc., and certainly their right to do so. So it's going to, it is a compromise situation. We talked about it at length at the ordinance committee level, and. The, the solution that we came up with, the compromise that we felt was fair, was the parking, no parking from 9 a.m. until 6 p.m. on Ocean House Road, from Bowery Beach Road to Kettle Cove, and on Pheasanton Road. The answer from 9 to 6 is that's what we felt was the heaviest usage of the beach time. And beach doesn't just mean the summer. Obviously, people in the fall and in the spring can also go on a beautiful, lovely day where it hits 60 degrees in the spring. It's crowded at the beach as well. So 9 to 6 meant no parking during the heavy crunch time, and yet in the evening or early morning, that's the time for gathering of friends and family where we'll be allowed. So in thinking it all through, it's a compromise that we felt worked in and unanimously bring as a recommendation to the council this evening. Thank you. Doug? I, I really don't know what to think of this 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. pack because I think it's going to be a real problem. No pack. No packing from 9 to 6. But I would highly recommend that notification be sent to every single person on the affected roads that something like this could happen. Um, I don't mind setting this for public hearing the way it's written, but I'm not sure that I agree with too much of it. Um, there's going to be some problems down there. There's some, some serious problems down there that this is going to upset and, and cause to make worse. And I would, uh, just to get this thing moving, ask that we set this for a public hearing and that notification be sent. And uh, hopefully those people will come up and give us some of their comments. At the October meeting? At the, uh, at, yes. How, how are they going to be notified? By mail. Okay, is there a second to Doug's motion? Second. Okay, discussion. Bill. Could I ask the police chief a question? Sure. What is your feeling on the 9 to 6 deal? The, the traffic wise, as far as uh, the busiest part of the day, was our thought, was from 9 to 6. Do you think if it was posted to that? time that it would be a big problem for the police department. I think it's a sensible compromise. Personally, I haven't seen that big a problem. There are a few days a year, and that's the price people pay for living near the water, if they're going to have a problem. And uh, it'll be a problem on those days for us, but, you know, it's certainly not an everyday kind of thing. There are days when it's a problem, of course, about it, but I think it's a decent compromise and we can work with that. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Okay, all, all those in favor of the motion to send this to public hearing at the regular October monthly meeting of the council. Any opposed? Motion carries seven to nine. Okay, item 170 is to consider a report from the ordinance committee regarding a process to deal with old violations of the zoning ordinance. This was an item we sent to the ordinance committee at the last meeting. Frank? Thank you, Madam Chairman. As the counselors will recall, this had to do with granting the code enforcement officer the right to send what we call a no action letter. This stemmed from the need of certain lending institutions to certify that an existing residence complied with local zoning ordinances when it was constructed. If a minor violation is found, um, we would grant a no action letter, which in effect would say, and I'm quoting from the town attorney's letter here, this is, what would, this is what would appear in the no action letter. It appears the structure was not built in strict compliance with the ordinance. However, given the time of construction and modest extent of violation, 
it's not the policy of the code enforcement administrator to bring an enforcement action for this violation. The inquiring party should be advised they are certainly free to bring a variance request before the zoning board. Basically, by the ordinance committee asking that we table it indefinitely, we're saying no to sending a no action letter. And the reasons are, the key, the key phrase that the town attorney says would have to be included in every one of these letters, I'll now read from his letter again, is the code enforcement administrator's letter should not be cons construed in any way to waive the rights of the town who may have to seek enforcement of the violation at some future time. What we felt at the ordinance committee uh, clearly was that this doesn't accomplish its real purpose. It doesn't do anyone any good. It doesn't give the owner what they really want, which is a clear way out, and puts the town in a very awkward position. <coughs> If you try to limit what the code enforcement officer can do, those limits can be called ar arbitrary. So we just felt that it was a not effective tool, a not clean way to govern, and we would uh, recommend that we table it indefinitely. But we would also add, this came up in the discussion, that we hope the staff will inform the different people that come uh, that have to seek a variance that it's in the long run it's their best way because it's the cleanest way it's a way that they don't have to worry down the line maybe the town will come after me etc so we really hope that that Ernie and our and our personnel here at town hall will explain this to the people as they come in and that yes they have to go to seek a variance but believe me in the long run it's much greater peace of mind so our recommendation is to table it definitely that motion. okay any discussion of this motion all those in favor of the motion? The motion carries seven to nothing. Thank you, Frank. Good report. Thank you. Okay, item 171 is to consider a report from the Appointments Committee regarding vacancies on town boards. Doug? Um, thank you, Madam uh, Chairman. The, uh, the Appointments Committee has been busy again. Uh, we're getting into a biannual meeting now so that we can fill a lot of slots in town, but we've come up with a list of names that we submitted about two weeks ago for the council to review for the positions on the Comprehensive Planning Commission, the Harbor Advisory Commission, Board of Sewer Appeals, and uh, Historical Preservation. Uh, I'll read the names that we present to you for confirmation tonight. And, and the Board of Commission that they'll be serving on. And I would hope that we could just have the one vote. As we get down to the Board of Sewer Appeals, I'll mention only the fact that as I give the names, we will give them the longest period of service in alphabetical order because that seems like the only fair way to do it. The manager and I will work out the terms that seem appropriate according to alphabetical order. Some of them will be going for three years, some for two, and some for one. And it just seemed fair this way. So under the Comprehensive Planning Commission, we propose Al Martin and Ian Finlayson. For the Harbor Advisory Commission, uh, William Jordan, Frank Latour, Douglas Tinsman, John Maxwell, Gary Cummins, Jim Kearney, and Richard Hall. Not that other individual is still under one or two day thought pattern whether or not to serve, so I excluded his name for the time being. The Board of Sewer Appeals, Carl Pearson, William Orkut Jr., Jack Roberts, Dave Bridges, and that's it. The uh, Board of Historical Preservation, still has an open slot and anyone who hasn't found anything better on television by nine o'clock give it some thought because <laughs> you're the type of person we're looking for uh, i would like to ask also that we be given the opportunity to submit another list of names to fill the two more slots on the comprehensive planning commission two more slots on the harbor advisory committee and one more slot on the Board of Sewer Appeals and that Board of Historical Preservation for next Monday night's meeting. And that will be, in essence, our council portion of the workshop. So I want to thank the committee members who are not yet done with their job, but uh, I'll be in touch with you this week. Thank you. OK, would you like to uh, recommend these names in the form of a motion? Yes. OK. Is there a second to that motion? 
Okay, any discussion? Yes, Bill? I would just like to say, I know I got a note and I was supposed to call in, but the more I got thinking about it, and as time goes on, sometimes I'm a little bit slow, I understand. How come you have no women on this harbor? You know, I think they're entitled, and they might have some thoughts as far as uh, that, uh, going down onto the beach and something. I haven't had any calls about it, but uh, I believe the females should be represented. Well, I, uh, I'd like to answer that, just so not to embarrass my two counterparts. That was, that was a concern that we had also, that there just didn't seem to be any females interested in serving on that board. Now, we do not discriminate in our appointments. I want to make that perfectly clear. Well, I have a there's call. No, there's, there was no thought whatsoever to any discrimination or leaving a female or leaving a male or any, any gender out of this. If you have a name, we need two more members of that board. And if you have a, a, a name or anyone on this council has a, has a name of any individual interested in serving on that board, we would desperately like to hear. Yes, Bill? Well, I had a name I passed on to the manager, and I figured it was going on to the committee now. Did I slip I up on the name manager also. slipped up? No. Who slipped up? No. no. The name was passed to the committee. I have a daily, you didn't like the name that I passed no, on? No, I don't know if that's true or not. We were trying to cover certain areas. We wanted to be sure that the council representatives that were asked were put on. We wanted to be sure that the boat people were put on, the fishermen were put on. I mean, we were covering certain expertise type areas, not necessarily genders. And I think all the names were brought up and discussed. But just because a name is, you know, sent to us or a person applies, doesn't mean that everybody gets appointed to a position. I understand that. But, but I think all the names were as discussed. I, excuse me, as I got it from the chairman, I, I understood that you didn't get any female names. On that idea. Okay, no, no, let me be perfectly clear. Just because an individual happens to be a female, she will not serve on a board that the committee does not recommend that position to be filled by that person, be it male or female. We don't discriminate going on or staying off. Okay, that was a, a good point to raise, however, Thank you. I had noticed that. I'm also. glad I done something right. <laughs> <laughs> <All> right. <laughs> okay. Any other comments or questions? All right, we do have a motion to accept these names as recommended by the Appointments Committee. All those in favor? Okay, that motion carries 7 to nothing.